Coming up on DTNS, Patrick Norton talks about moving tech into a new house during a pandemic, why many U.S. <laughs> health agencies will not use exposure notification apps. And this time, Google really, truly means it when they say they want a coherent messaging strategy. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, April, uh, wait, no, I'm just kidding, May 8th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm John Merritt. Who even knows what day it is or a month? Uh, I know where I am, though. Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Len Peralta. And from somewhere outside Roger. of St. Louis, I'm Patrick. Oops, sorry. Oh, See, I finally right. remembered at that time and stomped on Roger. <laughs> He's Patrick Norton. He's Roger Chang. He produces the show. We just spent a half hour reminiscing about MTV on Good Day Internet. You can get that at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Japan's Computer Entertainment Suppliers Association confirmed that the Tokyo Game Show, scheduled to start September 24th, has been canceled. The show will transition into a virtual event with more information expected later in May. Tom Warren at The Verge reports that according to sources, Microsoft will integrate cursor support into Office for iPad with plans to roll out the update by fall 2020. Support is expected for the unified Office for iOS app, as well as two separate Word, Excel, and PowerPoint apps. Apple says it will reopen stores in Dusseldorf, Frankfurt, and Rosenstrasse, Germany, and one store in Boise, Idaho, in the U.S., on Monday, May 11th. Three other stores in Alabama, Alaska, and South Carolina will open in the week. Customers and employees will have their temperature checked before it, it, entering the store and must wear masks as well. Samsung will launch a Samsung Pay debit card this summer, backed by a cash management account from SoFi. Google is reportedly working on its own branded payment card as well. And of course, we all know Apple has its own credit card, too. Clearview AI software performs facial recognition by comparing images to a database of photos that are scraped from the public internet. Google, YouTube, Microsoft, and Twitter have sent cease and desist letters to Clearview. In response to a lawsuit in Illinois, Clearview AI now says it will voluntarily cancel, quote, the accounts of every customer who was not either associated with law enforcement or some other federal, state, or local government department, office, or agency. I don't know if that'll make them drop the suit, but we'll see. Uh, Europe has commissioned a study of tech companies' preferences for their own services. They're looking into things like Amazon operating their own retail and a marketplace businesses that they compete with third parties. Apple's app development, but also having an app store that has apps that compete with Apple's own apps. Study's going to look at what would happen if rules were changed, like prohibiting companies from treating their own products differently on their platforms or even separating the businesses entirely. The study will also look at requiring data be to be shared with smaller rivals and data lock-in that makes it difficult for customers to switch to a competitor. A final report is due to the European Commission in five months. Months. All right, let's talk a little more about this Facebook redesign. Oh, there is one, Tom. Facebook announced its redesign at F8 last year, and then it was been rolled out in some waves. The company added an option to try out the new version in March, at least for some accounts. I was actually one of those accounts, so I've been hanging out with it for a couple months now. The redesign is official for everybody, and the option to update manually if you haven't received it is there as well. The new look promises faster load times, easier nav, and a dark mode for the desktop, which is something that a lot of people enjoy. The company is also seeking user feedback on the new look, whether you like it or don't like it. I got the, I rarely go to Facebook, uh, but I did maybe a month ago, I don't remember anymore. Uh, and I got the new look and my reaction was like, huh, simpler. Uh, it's, you know, got a lot of white space. Looks nice, but I haven't really been using it. Uh, Patrick, have you been using it? I actually go on Facebook even less than you do. So it's more <laughs> like, you know, that moment where you're like, is everything, oh, that's the one I want. And then I respond to somebody's message and I immediately shut down Facebook and restart my machine. <laughs> You know, when I got, I got, I have, you know, a, a Facebook burner account, which is a dramatic way to say that I've got more than one Facebook account. But in March, I got that, for whatever reason, that that account was, got pushed out to me right away. And so I had kind of my Sarah Lane account, which is my real Facebook account. And then this other one that I kind of use for just testing purposes. And I was like, huh, okay, well, let's go back and forth and see what's like dramatically different there really isn't much different. It looks different. It's cleaner. It's nicer. A um, lot of more white space, or I suppose when you're using dark mode, a lot more dark, dark space, space, but yeah. right. But um, 
it doesn't. I mean, it's it's it takes fifteen minutes to be like, okay, everyone's everything's still where it's supposed to be. The buttons are the same. Yeah, they, it, it sounds like they they streamlined some processes for for things, uh, and and the, and then streamlined the design. But functionally, it sounds like pretty much works the same. So. Yeah, it it looks nicer though. I'll give have them no that. fear. Uh, adopt the new look on the desktop. <laughs> it was interesting. They were talking about the fact that they sort of let the desktop design linger because they were so focused on mobile for so many years and they're finally get around, uh, getting around to just, just cleaning it up. That's probably why it's not so fundamentally different functionally because this isn't a functional change. This is and just kind of bringing the design into the modern era. Yeah, and it's probably why I was like, oh, this just looks better, like mm -hmm. a mobile app, but it's the same. Uh, you know, yeah. that, that's exactly what they were going for. India's federal government allowed for the resumption of smartphone production last month, but state governments had the final say over when conditions were safe to resume, and that is now finally happening at states in India. Xiaomi, Vivo, Samsung, Oppo, and several other ODMs have received state approval for production. Xiaomi will resume some production with Foxconn in the state of Andhra Pradesh. Uh, sources speaking to TechCrunch report Wistron will resume limited production for Apple in Bangalore. Vivo says it's going to resume 30% production capacity while Oppo and Samsung will resume production at the Greater Noida facility with around 3,000 employees working in rotation. Uh, uh, while this is happening, Nikkei Asian Review also reporting that Apple is moving about 30% of its AirPods production out of China, uh, where production has been resumed for a while, into Vietnam. Uh, so Apple wanting to diversify its supply chain, uh, having Wistron come back online in India helps with that. Moving production into Vietnam helps with that as well. You know, this is clearly when you, you know, this story is like, okay, we are slowly but surely getting back to some sense of normalcy. However, when I go, okay, 30% production capacity, that's significantly less of what, you know, these companies have been used to in the past. And how much is this going to be, you know, a lasting effect on, you know, quarterly earnings and people getting phones? Yeah. Because we're we're not saying that everything's back now, right? It's everything is starting to come back, uh, and I think it's interesting about that Apple move into Vietnam is that it's not going to come back the same. Companies have been burned a little by having their supply chains affected. Uh, either because of just-in-time inventory or most parts coming from one region. And when that region got shut down, everything got shut down. Patrick, do you have any thoughts on this before we move on? It seems like something that they were probably well into the process of starting before COVID hit. And now they're, the, it, it, it's, you know, if I, I, it feel it smells like something that they had already been working on kind of diversifying the locations and possibly mm -hmm. in response to tariffs and other things. Um, you know, I think to, you know, Sarah, I think that what's, what I'm really curious about is is where demand is. You know, we have so many people out of work at this point in the United States. I'm 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 kind of curious. You know, what employment looks like in India and China and other places. I think there's just going to be a massive knock on effect because revenues are down so far, and I think it's going to take time for both demand. I think for some things there's a huge demand. Like as soon as the restaurants mm -hmm. are open, it's going to be the greatest day in tips and ever. Hopefully, uh, <laughs> if you go to a restaurant after COVID. Do me a favor, tip heavily and tip often, but or a bar or anything else. But um, I think there's going to be, a, I think it's going to take time. I think it's going to be a really long, gradual sort of U-shaped recovery mm -hmm. after this one. Um, at least that's what smarter people tell me. Well, speaking of recovery, or here's hoping anyway, Google announced it would bring its collective communication products under the oversight of VP and GM of G Suite, Javier Soltero. This now includes Messages, Duo, the phone app on Android, Google Meet, Google Chat, already part of G Suite. Speaking to The Verge, Soltero said there are no immediate plans to change or integrate any of Google's messaging apps and that the company believes people chose Google's messaging apps for specific purposes. Okay. Listen, okay, yeah, carry on. <laughs> Soltero, if you're not familiar with him, joined Google back in October. He was previously the co-founder of Accompli and VP for Microsoft's Office Group. So, I mean, knows what he's doing. I actually am a huge fan of Accompli, but... But uh, but yeah, I mean, this is quite an undertaking, isn't it? How many? I mean, how how many names do we have for things that do lots of the same things? I want to start by saying that <laughs> Soltero did a great job with Accompli. Maybe he's finally the guy for the job. 
I don't want to let that point be missed. I don't want to damn Javier Soltero before he's had a chance to get started. But man, this is not the first time. Google is, has tried. They almost had it, right? They had it all unified under Hangouts. And then they just got bored and were like, oh, you know what? Like, maybe we'll just bust Hangouts up. <laughs> it's not even the first time that Google has unified messaging under one person. Nick Fox, who's still at Google, was given this job. His response was to launch Google Allo and actually add another product to the, to the thing. That's gone now too. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, Google's messaging uh, strategy has been a mess for a long time. It's not the first time they've tried to solve it. I don't know, Patrick. Maybe maybe I Soltero just, can do it, right? I, maybe he can't, but it's I, the best line, of, like the part I started like trying not to laugh out loud was there are no immediate <laughs> plans to change or integrate any of Google's messaging cap because there is no plan. And even <laughs> if they have a plan, just as soon as your business gets it fully integrated or it becomes a part of your life, they end it with little notice and no reason. Um, not well, that I feel but passionate a part, of, about this. A part of that is probably it being like, okay, so Tara's going to come and fix everything, but let's not, you know, make people afraid that we're killing off products just yet. You're not right, going to make right. any changes to our products. <laughs> we're just hiring point. somebody who's really smart. Um, and then, you know, we're going to hear about it, uh, you know, several months down the road. Yeah. If they said they were going to change things, people would be up in arms about Google killing products. So uh, I do like that Hiroshi Lockheimer, who's the head of uh, he's the SVP of Chrome and Android and Soltero's boss, Soltero will report to him, uh, said that we're looking forward now in a way that has a much more coherent vision. <laughs> I would say maybe has a vision uh, would be a place to start. Uh, I don't maybe that's too well, harsh. A vision where, where was clearly the bottom? stated. Yeah. Uh, go Javier Soltero. I'm cheering for you. Wired has a headline up that says, quote, health officials say no thanks to contact tracing tech. Now, that may sound odd if you've been hearing stories here on DTNS and elsewhere about all of the different countries adopting either a centralized app they make themselves or a decentralized app, uh, possibly based on the Apple Google approach. All of those countries we've been talking about are not in the United States. We talked about India's app that they made themselves. We talked about Germany going decentralized. We talked about UK kind of playing it both ways right now. They're making a decentralized one maybe. They're also got one they're testing on the Isle of Wight. The US, however, has no national app strategy. And Wired says that New York, California, Massachusetts, as well as the cities of Baltimore and San Francisco have all decided not to use apps for contact tracing. Instead, they're just hiring people to do it. Now, all of these these app efforts are also supplemented, or in, in some ways they are supplementing uh, manual contact tracing, but these parts of the US are just doing manual. Massachusetts plans on hiring 1,000 contact tracers. New York, 17,000. California, 20,000. Uh, there's even a national plan. Scott Gottlieb and Adam, Andy Slavitt proposed a $12 billion national plan that would need 180,000 contact tracers. And we've talked about the fact that manual tracing is better uh, than, than apps, but that apps can sort of help fill in the gaps. Tech is being used for these manual contact tracing, uh, things like health record access. Uh, automatically texting people who are in actual quarantine. We kind of use quarantine loosely, but there's the people who are like, no, you really can't go around other people. Texting them information, making sure they're okay. Tablets for the manual tracers to conduct data analysis while they're in interviewing people. Uh, getting location data from a user's phone with consent so they can see where they've been directly and start figuring out who they might need to interview and who they might need to contact. Uh, New York is putting together three apps one to match test results with correct patients, one to give patients an easy way to share relevant phone numbers to contact tracers so they don't make a mistake when they're writing it down. Uh, and Utah's Healthy Together app connects infected users with contact tracers and uses location data to rebuild timelines. Again, saying like, hey, can we get the location data off your phone? That might help us figure out where you've been and who you might have been in contact with. Uh, I, 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 I don't know... Uh, what the conclusion here is, uh, because manual tracing is the better way to do it, and, and but it seems like some of these health agencies are saying getting in a, on one of these apps from Apple and Google just isn't worth our time. Uh, there, there's better uses for technology that can help manual tracing. Oof, Pat, I don't know how you feel about this. Um, it's starting to, we we got a lot of a lot of conflicting arguments about what is the best way to figure out who's sick and how the rest of us don't get sick. 
That's why I think we should probably just put a permanent quarantine underneath all of humanity for the next decade. <laughs> yeah. and, uh... Well, barring that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's. I think it's messy. I think part of the problem is is certainly um, most tech companies, <clears throat> Facebook, uh, <clears throat> uh, other tech companies have done such a have such a horrible reputation for doing a decent job of handling you know privacy and and it's just. It's a mess. Uh, mostly, I'm just kind of blown away with with the size of these offices, or, or the size of these groups. That like, Matt, you know, Massachusetts thousand, okay, but like seventeen thousand, twenty thousand um, people. This is just, I'm delighted with the idea of actually using people for this. I just, I think it's <sighs> developing a mobile app is a nightmare for a well funded, organized company with world class developers trying to put something out. So I can totally see why actually having physical people. And databases probably is a smarter thing. It's just it's it's never as simple as anybody thinks. Ah, oh, you just build an app; it'll be great, you know. And it does this, and it'll access that, and then we'll do this, you know, anonymized data thing that'll track everybody. And and invariably, somebody sells it to somebody, and everybody gets pissed off. Um, uh, I may be a little ranty about this. Um, <laughs> I, well, know. yeah, I I I am very complimentary of the privacy protections of the Apple Google platform. I think I think they're really yes. solid. I think they've done a, a great I, job on you that. You are correct. But you shouldn't. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that all the health agencies agree. There, we could say, oh, there seems to be disagreement. There really is only disagreement about whether to implement an app or not. There's right. agreement that manual tracing is the best way. Uh, there is no disagreement about that. And maybe that hasn't got through in all of these stories, but. Manual tracing means I've talked to an individual, I helped jog their right. memory, I got solid ideas of where they spent the most time. Yeah, they're not going to remember every single person they passed by in a grocery store, but I'll know they went to the grocery store and who right. they talked with there. Like, oh, I remember seeing my friend Gene there. And manual tracing has fewer places where things can go wrong than Apple Google's Bluetooth because Bluetooth you know, doesn't really know distance very well. And it can, it can, no. it can be interfered with and it might not work and it might crash. And so I can see where some health agencies say, look, it could be helpful. Let, let's do right. it. Uh, Cause more data is better. And I can see other health agencies saying, yeah, but why, why waste our, our resources doing that when we're going to get almost all the way there with manual tracing anyway. And then we won't have to worry about dealing with the margin of error on these apps and any privacy problems are gone now because we're just dealing with manual tracing. Yeah. I, I... Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Kind of. Yeah. yeah. It sort of trickles off. Uh, you know, the I don't know if you continues. could hear Patrick just putting up his hands, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I give up. Uh, on Wednesday, Spotify CEO Daniel Ek told Bloomberg that Apple has a long way to go before it is an open and fair platform. Spotify yeah. is pursuing antitrust action against Apple in Europe for limiting how third party app music apps work on iOS. Particularly, Spotify complained about the 30% revenue share on any purchase made on iOS. Sonos co-founder John McFarlane said, open Twitter, uh, on Twitter, rather, quote, solid irony here. Having worked closely with both Apple and Spotify, I would say it's more significantly, it's significantly more difficult to work with in Spotify's closed ecosystem than Apple's. Respect and appreciate both companies, but open Spotify is not. Patrick, you want to take this? You could hear the walls in Daniel, the glass walls in Daniel X house shattering uh, <laughs> in the middle of that. Like I was reading an interview and I'm like, are you kidding me? Spotify, like there's there's third party platforms that are desperate to work with Spotify. Spotify refuses. They want total control over the, it's, it's the fact that he said this is like half the music industry that deals with software is just pointing and laughing at him. Um not just, you know, Sonos has a pretty good operating, uh, you know, relationship with them, but other companies that have tried to work with them are like, yeah, they have no interest. They don't care. Please stop back as us to integrate Spotify because we can't um, because Spotify won't let us. And it's, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I love that's the Spotify, thing. But... I would normally defend Spotify. Like, look, it's their platform. They can decide what they want to let on. I mean, as a podcaster, I'm glad our podcast is on Spotify, but when it wasn't, I didn't hold it against Spotify. Cause it's like, well, they get to decide who they let in and who they don't. Right. 
But where, where it does break down is Spotify is pointing at Apple saying, but they shouldn't be allowed the same thing. And granted, these are different situations. Uh, what Spotify is saying is the iOS is a much wider platform and they shouldn't force us not to be able to charge in the way we want. And that is the big issue is Apple says 30% no matter what, and you can't work around it in any possible way. You have to either charge 30% or you can't charge through your app on iOS at all. And that's one of the big things Spotify and others are upset about, which is a little different than not integrating yeah. with Sonos easily. Uh, so, so I get where there's a difference, but there is also some overlap there. Yeah, it's also, I mean, the other thing that doesn't help is that Apple has developed special relationships with certain yep. companies that have, where they are not charging 30%. So that certainly muddies up the water some. That is only for video and only for very narrowly defined, very large companies, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> You couldn't even keep a Not straight face on that wording, one. But yeah. Hey, folks, if <laughs> you want to get want all to the resell our products, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. All right, folks, uh, as we mentioned at the top of the show, Patrick Norton uh, moving into a new house at a very interesting time to be moving into a new house. Uh, no, I mean, normally we would want you to talk about uh, just all the things you're running into as you try to set up technology in a new house, because that's helpful as, as people are always moving. Uh, but I imagine it's it's even more interesting right now. It's certainly, uh, you know, the, oh, goodness, I, I have to fly back to where all of our household furnishings are stored so I can get them and bring them back. So part of me has been like stealing myself to not go into a complete panic and hyperventilating uh, on an airplane as I fly to where I am picking up, you know. <laughs> it, it, I was laughing is not the right word, but I'll, I'll say I was laughing about that. Mm. Um, it's also interesting because, you know, especially millennials, um, are moving more often and uh, or, or more frequently, I think, than uh, anybody in their age bracket has in the last couple, four or five decades, and especially in urban areas. It's actually kind of shocking how fast people in the, that, that age bracket are moving these days. Um, it's uh, it's funny. The first thing I thought about this as I was like writing down notes was like Google search Internet options and then the name of the town you're moving to for ISP options, um, because a lot of people don't actually know even real estate agents or, or landlords don't actually know what options are available uh, and schedule an appointment early. Uh, you know, it's basically get the electric turned on and then make sure the Internet shows up right after that. And as ridiculous as that sounds, in some places uh, or some services, they actually have a fairly hefty lag time. Uh, and when I say fairly hefty, I mean, it could be a week uh, after you take possession of the place, which doesn't sound like forever until you're in a house for a week without Internet. Um, when you're transitioning to a new house, it's not a bad time to upgrade routers. But do yourself a favor. Keep your old, reliable router nearby until you verify that the new router actually works. That may sound mm -hmm. silly until you've actually had to walk over to a neighbor's house and borrow a cup of router. Um, <laughs> A lot of people don't know they exist, but two-gallon Ziploc bags are possibly my favorite thing ever for organizing uh, parts and electronics uh, because they are huge. Uh, they fit almost anything. You can actually fit a lot of laptops inside of them with their power supplies. Um, and, you know, if the more time you spend packing your stuff, the less likely you are to be running around trying to figure out where the particular power supply for your router is. Um, I actually, you know, like to have a box which has sort of the house network inside of it so that everything I need, like, okay, they've connected the internet and I have my box and then my router and all of the things I need to get kind of basically everything up and running. Uh, this all may sound obvious to people who are highly organized uh, or who don't move off often, but there's nothing worse than knowing like, okay, the router's in one of those 15 boxes, kids, and you can watch, you know, yeah. Phineas and Ferb once you well, found the router. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so easy to be packing and go like, oh, well, well, these cables are in the same box. I'm sure it'll be easy to find them. And it's like, no, man, just put them in that Ziploc bag and label that bag, tape it to the router, like do a couple extra things that makes your life so much easier on the other end. I moved nine times before I was 12. I literally, when I when I pack a box, I write up what's in the box on three sides of it so that if it goes into a storage unit, I can always have a side facing out with the name of what's inside of it. Um, man, uh, HGTVs, you actually should transport them vertically if you're moving yourself. Um, you know, that, you know, the, the magic, you know, LCD juice is not going to drip out of the monitor if it's stored flat, but... Um, the the panel is actually supported vertically, and when you put it horizontally and then bounce it, it's much more likely for you to create a stress fracture in the center of uh, the screen, which is really heartbreaking. Um, you know, keep something soft and dirt free between the screen and any furniture blankets. And if you're renting furniture blankets, assume that somebody has stomped on uh, 
you know, a giant pile of sand on them. So get something, you know, yeah, fleece yeah. blankets are pretty good. Uh, fresh fleece blanket, you know, band it around there and then store it vertically in between a couple of mattresses or the inner and outer liner of your mattress. Is a great I can tell, I can tell you, you want to take Patrick's advice on this because uh, <laughs> the only way that I felt safe having my DLP TV moved uh, in circa, you know, 2005, 2006 was with Patrick's help. I, uh, he really knows what he's talking about here. I've moved too many times. <laughs> I remember that TV, um, you know, and on my obsession with routers and having your internet, because apparently that's the most important thing in my life after my family uh, and dog. Uh, Wi-Fi analyzers are incredibly useful. If you're on Android, uh, you can actually get a Wi-Fi analyzer app on Android, which is a fantastically useful tool for figuring out if you figured out the optimal placement for a router inside of your house. If you have multiple mesh networks, uh, devices, it's probably not as critical. Um, they they don't really exist on iOS, uh, in which case you'll be using your laptop. But uh, Wi-Fi Analyzer uh, by Abdelrahman M. Sid is an excellent, inexpensive tool, and you will be able to stand in corners of your house, and it will tell you sort of which channel you should be using, um, because there's nothing more charming than discovering you can gain a healthy bump in your Wi-Fi speed by changing the channel of your router, because everybody around you and all the other houses are all running the same channel. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good one. I mean, the channel won't matter so much for what I'm about to say, but but the placement, it's so much easier to figure that out before you've unpacked everything, right? <laughs> because you have yeah. so many more options of where you can put that router and then you can unpack things around it. So it's a good thing to it's, do early on. You know, it, it, as long as your router, it, it can be problematic if you have a basement you have to cover, but generally speaking for most people, as high as you can get as close to the center of the house. And uh, if you don't have, if you can keep it out of a closet, you know, if you can find sort of a piece of furniture to stash it on top of, it can be amazing how much a little bit of elevation can do for your Wi-Fi performance. So... And uh, real quickly, uh, when you're talking about finding internet options, uh, I, I haven't moved in a couple of years now. It's a, It's been a while. Uh, but broadbandnow.com was really helpful at finding all the options. Uh, yeah. in, and, and I think they still are good. Did you use them? Uh, I literally went to six different websites, uh, highspeedinternet.com, broadband now is actually generally the first results you're going to get on Google on that. Yeah. Um, you know, there are some that are just, terrible link baity sites that are trying to right. pick up you a, watch out a for those. gig for redirecting you. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, it was, it was, I, I, common.net is the provider I was using in, uh, Alameda and they're a, a, uh, startup company that, that they're, they're, we were in their sort of test zone. And I remember, uh, being really heartbroken because I thought we were moving and I would never be able to find an awesome internet provider again. And to a certain point I was right. Uh, because there's fiber from AT&T available on my block. And I hate to complain about that, but I've had such a complicated relationship with AT&T. Um, but uh, it's good to scan around because you might be shocked. Like Common was almost half the price of what I was paying for cable, but it was four times as fast and it was uncapped. So it was, you know, search around. And even if you know, you're just in your house now, Every, you know, every once a year, every six months, search to find out if there's a new provider in your area, because if there is, you might get a shocking improvement in your speed or a shocking reduction in your bill. Or as I did with Common.net, who is not paying me, I just love them that much. Um, it was a shocking increase in speed. It was symmetrical upload and download. It was a significantly less amount of money than we were paying uh, Comcast. Uh, and I got to leave Comcast. So it was like a win, a win, a win and a win for me. <laughs> Amazing. Everybody join in the conversation in our Discord, whether you're moving or not. Everybody could probably benefit from going through a few of those old boxes you just haven't opened in a few years. You can join the conversation by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's check out the mailbag. Oh, let's do it. We got a real nice one from Gadget Smart who wrote, Happy to be joining your associate producer crew after listening for free with ads for far too long. Tom, Sarah, Roger, Patrick, Scott, Justin, all of your guests have given us a wonderful show. Keep them coming. Oh, thank you, Gadget Aww. Smart. Yeah, uh, super nice. Uh, that's really nice. Also, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Sonia Vining, Rushan Brantley, and Paulo Jacob. Len Peralta has been illustrating the episode uh, for us. What have you drawn today, Burke Brethed of DTNS? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, Patrick had some great advice, obviously, for moving. But I think the biggest pit pitfall of moving tech into your new home 
is uh, having your smart home lock you out. Uh, <laughs> and here is here's an image of uh, some guy trying to get into his house. I don't know if it's Patrick or not, but it could be. Uh, and he's asking Siri, Alexa, Cortana, anyone? I'm trying to move in and you've locked me out of the house. So uh, the house may be smarter than you. So that's the first thing. The first thing is being able to get into the house to get the tech into your house. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's the biggest pitfall of them all. I like that skylight, though. One, yeah, once you do nice? get in, I'm like, what does it look like inside? It looks kind of <laughs> cool. I know. I know. It's a very cool-looking <laughs> house. It's very we can't get in. Yeah. I know. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this is available right now at my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len, or, of course, at my online store at lenperaldostore.com. Uh, so there you go. Thank you, Lynn. Also, thanks to Patrick Norton for being with us this fine Friday. Patrick, you are a busy man these days, uh, definitely on the move, but you are uh, still giving stuff, uh, giving people what they want. And where can they find out more about that? Uh, AVXL.com is a place to go. I'll have uh, some other announcements to made after after the floors are finished and the house is filled and the internet is on, which hopefully won't happen in that order. Uh, I will be launching some other stuff nice. a little later this spring. Ooh. Very cool. Uh, folks, uh, thank you for your support of this show uh, directly. Uh, now more than ever, we really, 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 really appreciate everybody who can support us doing so. Uh, Patreon.com slash DTNS uh, pays the bills. It feeds Roger's children and, and Sarah and my dogs. Uh, and we appreciate every single one of you. However, we know that uh, not everybody is in a situation where they can afford to do that. If you're still enjoying the show on the free version of the feed, thank you for that. Just tell folks about it. Uh, the biggest thing you can do to help other people discover the show is to review it on iTunes. I don't know. You're like, I don't use iTunes. I use uh, Pocket Cast or Dreamcast or, or some other thing. That's fine. You can review it there too. But if you can review it on iTunes, that is a bigger platform with bigger discovery. Uh, and even just giving us stars, you don't have to write anything, helps us out. So uh, that's another way to support us here at Daily Tech News Show. If you've got something to get off your chest, well, we got an email address, and we want those emails. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. If you'd like to join us live, we're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back on Monday with Charlotte Henry as our guest. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>